now these feminism series, the reason I'm doing this over again, for a number of reasons, there's a, a whole lot of new people here that have probably never heard these. If you have heard them, you really haven't heard them. It's not the same as being in the room when you listen to them. It's a little different. Also, um, the ones online, the recordings are really bad. They're really, really bad. Um, and I'm going to title these. <laughs> they didn't get titled. When who, The person that put them on just put them on as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, or 8. I stopped at 8, and I don't think I really finished. This time I think I'll finish this this book through this book here. And then, I mean, there's some other supplemental things that I could do with this study of feminism. I could get into all of the Stalinism and all the other things and, and, and just the different. There's a lot of other things you can get through. But primarily what this is going to deal with is feminism in America and how it influenced everything. And I'm going to tell you something. I want you to ponder. I want you to think about a few things here. Here's one thing I want you to think about. Let me pray, and then I'll get into that. Father, Lord, I pray you be with us now. Help us as we go through this. Help hearts to be tender, to receive it, Lord. Correct us, Lord. Guide us and direct us. Use this, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, when, I, when we look at this, I, I want you to think about a few things. I want you to think about, number one, how much... I think your answers will change at the end of this, but I will say, number one, this. How much has feminism influenced you? That's the first question I want you to ask yourself. Ladies, I want you to write that down, or in your heart... Just take a note of that. You don't have to, if you don't have anything to write down with, that's fine. But take a note of that. How has feminism influenced you? Has it influenced you? And to what degree has it influenced you? Then think about that. Now, probably what you would say is, oh, you know, you might say a lot. Some of you might say, oh, no, I don't think that much. Okay. Somewhere in between, you're going to fall there. I think you're going to. I think you're going to find that it is absolutely. Um, you're, you're going to absolutely understand at the end of this that it's influenced you a lot. Now that's for the ladies. Now men, I'm going to ask you a question. How much has in, feminism influenced you? How much has it influenced you as a man? How much has it influenced the way you lead? How much has it influenced the makeup of your family, the function of your family, so to speak? That's the question you have to ask yourself. Uh, now, I guarantee if I, if I handed out handouts and I had you do a checklist and I brought them back in, and then at the end of this, if I, had you bring, if I, if I brought out che a checklist and then I had you fill it out again, I guarantee the answers would be different. Because this is very, it's very compelling, but it's very instructive, and it digs in deep to the root of the problem. I'm telling you that I believe that feminism has completely changed the local New Testament churches in America. It has absolutely influenced them so greatly, so greatly that, um, I'm sure that's pulled that close. Well, I just want to make sure it's close enough, but I guess it is. I guess it's fine, yeah. Um, but it has influenced us so greatly that we don't even realize the structure, the order of the churches. I'm going to read you some things, and I'm going to start out with this. And I think I'll probably just title this first one. The whole series I'm going to title The Menace of Feminism. And then after that, each one, this will be called Feminism, Identical Rights versus Equal Rights. You know, something like that. And then I'll go through. And then I'm going to talk about, you know, the effects of feminism or the, you know, um, the results of feminism, which are frightening, by the way. And you're going to see the warning that was put out. This, this book was originally published in the, in the 1860s or 1870s. Uh, just to give you a background, uh, the la uh, I'll, I'll read you some of this, but... but this book was published back then. It is called, it's very hard to find, and you probably won't find it in book form. If you do, you'll pay a lot of money for it. Uh, last time I checked, it was, you could probably have it printed maybe, and we'll see what that would cost. But the last time I checked, this book, there were like 10 of them left, and when I preached on it in somebody's church, they all bought it. 
and they 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 like cleaned it out. Uh, Josh Dab, I either preached on it or I talked about. No, I think I talked about it in a roundtable discussion we had with all the men. They probably didn't want me to talk to the women, but <laughs> but uh, for fear of my life, they lowered me down in a basket <laughs> and got me out of there. Um, and I got me on my horse and I rode away. <laughs> but anyway, but uh, it's, it's that it's that real. <laughs> But anyway, but they bought them all up, and there was, like, nothing left. I don't even know where I got this book from, but when I got it, it was like, oh, it just, like, came down. I was, I was like, are you are you kidding me, this book? And it was, like, it was, like, literally saying Sikkim when I first saw this book. I was like, are you kidding me? Where did this come from? And I started looking at it, I was like, this is going to be great. And it did help a lot. I'm not telling you. No talking. Please edit him out. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, feminism, woman and her work. That's what it's called. Now, J.W. Porter was the one that, that brought it all together. Okay, he, he compiled it all. But this is from some of the top Southern Baptists of the time, before the Southern Baptist apostasy. Um, this was, by the way, I would argue that feminism brought on a lot of the Southern Baptist apostasy. Definitely. Women speaking out in meetings and all kinds of stuff. So uh, that was the women's suffrage movement, which we'll get to and we'll explain all those things. But I'm going to read you, and it, there's about 20 pages that we'll cover today of this. A lot of information here, but I want to read you some of the introduction here to the original edition. And, you know, then read you the, the second one. And the reason for that is because he tells why, why it was compiled. There was a war that was raging in the 1860s and 70s at that time. It was a war against the family. It was the war of feminism. The women's suffrage movement was moving quickly on the backbone of ending slavery. When they ended slavery, they partnered together with, feminism partnered together with the abolition of slavery to push the feminist movement and the equality of women. Now, these Baptist men stood up and warned against this. They were men that heralded the truth. Uh, John Broadus was one of them. Very good man. T.T. Um, T. Eaton was another one. Um, Boyce Taylor, another one. B.H. Carroll, another one. Uh, J.W. Porter, obviously a really good one. You've heard of some of those names. I'm sure you probably have, Jacob, heard of a few of those. Yeah, B.H. Carroll. I've got his interpretation of the scriptures back there. Uh, a few other books that he wrote, a um, lot of good stuff on the church. He was local church only. They were brighters, a lot of them. They were disciples of, of a lot of more disciples of J.R. Graves and other people like that. And I don't agree with J.R. Graves on his brighters and everything, but I do on local church only issue. But uh, anyway, so uh, there, was a, there was a war and a battle that went on, but it was raging. And it was, it was, they stood up and wrote this, and they knew what was coming. They knew the attack was coming, and they knew what the results were going to be. They, uh, the results were already out there. They were, it was already starting. And so, uh, the reappraisement of the scriptures teaching upon the position of women in Christian churches is most timely. Composite authorship, authorship has its disadvantages, but we regard this present volume, edited and partly written by Dr. J.W. Porter. He wrote The Baptist Debt to the World and The World's Debt to Baptists. Have you ever seen those books? Those are two Baptist history books that he wrote, J.W. Porter did. Um, good books, I have one of those back there. As the best possible initial volume that could be set forth in furthering a fresh study of this subject among Southern Baptists. Now understand this, when they came out with this, this was not popular, just like it isn't now. That's why nobody hardly wants to talk about it. You don't see a lot of sermons on sermon audio, you don't see a lot of things about feminism, because it is not popular to talk about, because you will definitely make some people mad especially in fundamental Baptist churches, um, because they run half the churches. They run. They make sure those women are happy because they run half the churches. So, Oh, no, he didn't. Yes, he did. The, pro 
The primary, pur- the primary purpose of the editor is frankly to aid Baptists in such a study of feminist, feminist tendencies in the churches, though the argument will be found of the highest value to all other students of the woman question in the churches. He's saying is the importance and the scope of this was they were changing the order in the churches. They were subtly doing it because that's how Satan works. He's subtle. He's more subtle than any beast of the field. Very subtle. It doesn't, it's not, you can't win by revealing all your secrets, right? Who is that? Oh my goodness. Should have known. All right. Dr. Porter has been able to assemble the practical unanimous voice of the Southern Baptist scholarly conviction in the period immediately preceding that of modern liberalizing tendencies to the effect that the teaching of the scriptures do define and limit the position of women in regard to their general place in life and in regard to their position in New Testament churches. It would perhaps be impossible on any subject of Bible interpretation to assemble a more impressive unanimous array of responsible Baptist conviction. It could hardly be done even on the question of what constitutes New Testament baptism. I mean, what he's saying is is that these men agree more than you take five Baptist preachers and put them in a room and talk about baptism. These ten guys agree more on the subject of feminism being a problem and the order that God has in his churches than than they would on baptism itself. That's, that's a pretty bold statement. I'm going to tell you why. Because what, ha- what started to happen back there in the 1870s, every, 1860s, 70s, everything was changing. They were evolving and they were changing. And I'm telling you, all it is is evolution. And feminism is nothing more than evolution. And it has crept into the churches. And it's there now. And churches have evolved now. They have. It is evident. Either these men were all wrong and the New Testament's wrong about the order or our churches today are severely in disorder. That's the question you have to ask yourself. Because everything they say is based off the scriptures. What's being done now in the churches is based off of practicality, relativism, Whatever works, whatever makes people happy. And families are being destroyed completely. In 1918, the Southern Baptist Convention meeting at Hot Springs, Arkansas, by a formal vote, opened the way for women to become messengers to that body. It was then understood and has since transpired that this would be followed by women's membership on boards, women speakers before mixed assemblies, etc. It was probably not generally understood that this action inevitably slants in the direction of women preachers, but such is now believed to be the case by many Baptists who point to this unscriptural practice as an actual consummation among not a few American evangelical bodies. They chose that 1912 act right there. They said that is what caused more women preachers to come out because the Southern Baptist Convention did that. They had women messengers to bodies, and they started to do that. Several influences have combined to prevent Southern Baptists from giving the attention. So he goes on, he explains how the interchurch movement and Dr. J.B. Gambrell kind of gave to the new movement of women messengers, and he gave it a lot of influence, and he, he caused a lot of damage. And they loved him because he did a lot for missions and everything, but he ended up hurting things. Uh you know, anyway, but it would be a strange and alarming thing if a great and free Christian body should allow to transpire a reversal of the belief and practice of the entire history on a matter involving their conception of scriptural teaching without so much as trying to give it a serious consideration. We are in times when rationalism and modernism flout and explain away many plain teachings of the Bible on the vain hypothesis that the book is an evolution, not inspired, but developed from crude beginnings. For Baptists to accept without even discussing or investigating the issues involved, the implications of the rather precipitate actions which was taken at Hot Springs on the women question would suggest either that they too have become infected with the current liberalistic tendencies or that they have lost their passion to know and follow the teachings of the book. I'm telling you, feminism, when it got into the churches, it filled the land. It indoctrinated it. 
It indoctrinated it. The feminist movement in social, economic, and political life has shown an alarming tendency to flout the Bible. There is no avoiding the evidences of a certain spiritual kinship between the feminist movement and the current liberalizing tendencies in women's relationships to the churches. We are happy to know that the distinguished editor has added a volume on feminism from his own pen. We predict for the work of a large circulation and profound influence, and we hail these omens as tokens of an abiding and abundantly justified disposition of our people. In their seeking after wisdom, not to fall into the swell-headed world conceit which harasses our day of seeking to be wiser than that which is written in the Word of God. See, who's the one that said, Yea, hath God said? Right. That was it. Now, that, this is the introduction. I want to read you a part of this introduction. It's very short here of the 1995 edition. Understand, this book was not printed very much. Anybody want to guess why this book was not printed very much? Why would some... How am I doing that? That's weird. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. Get distracted for a second. <laughs> Why? Why was this not... What's that? Not popular. No, it's not because it's green. It's because it's not popular. How many preachers want to talk about this subject? How many preachers will... Talk about this subject. Most of their churches would split in half if they if they brought this up in a normal Sunday. That's true. Or there'd be a lynching, one of the two. You know what the prominent women did in the Bible, right? When the when the apostles came and they preached? All the prominent Jews in the city and all the prominent, they chased him out of town and tried to have him killed. Yeah. Okay, feminism is not a new thing. It has been festering in America for a century and a half. That it, that it is not new is evident by the date of the various articles to this book. It had reared its ugly head in their day, and to the credit of these authors, they recognized to be a hor horrible affront to the word of God. So see how he's writing this in 1995. He says, though feminism is not new, it is certainly more brazen than ever. This is back in 95. It has become a political and economic force to be reckoned with. We have seen their wrath as they cry, we're feminists and we're in your face. They do cry that, actually. Like most movements that are spawned by a degenerate society, feminism has found its way into the liberal churches. Every movement seems to have a religious element which seeks to bring its ideology to bear upon the churches. The liberal church leaders, which are blind leading the blind, have prostituted themselves to feminism. I would say the fundamental Baptist churches have. We've seen the effects. Desexing the Bible and hymnals and ordaining lesbians to the ministry. This is back in 95. Every cult movement has both the hardcore fanatics and the fringe element. Feminism is no exception. The hardcore, die-hard zealots are the ones that set the agenda and drive the movement. The fringe members embrace the movement for some lesser reasons than the leaders. Many women and men assume that the aim of feminism is equal treatment and pay, adequate restroom facilities, and freedom from sexual harassment. Feminism is really about the worship of woman. As seen by the words of some of their leaders, it is about hatred for men. It is about deifying women as an object of worship. It is about the promotion of lesbianism and abortion. Sound right? It's about defying the word of God. It's about evolution. Feminism has sparked a new round in the gender war. It has purposely driven a further wedge between men and women. It attacks marriage and the traditional family when God ordained, which God ordained in the beginning. That's what the attack is for. Satan knows that if he destroys the family unit in America, he destroys America. Because that destroys the churches, and then the churches, so goes the, so goes the country. Right? 
There is only one way to assess and judge any movement, and that is by the word of God. For Christians, the scripture is the final authority. What God says is what we believe to be right. It is by scripture the various authors of these articles weigh feminism. Feminism is weighed in the balance and found wanting. It is against scripture and therefore unchristian and ungodly. As you read these pages, remember that you must be guided by Scripture alone, that the standard of God never changes, not even with the social climate of society. Hear these men as they set forth the teaching of Scripture on the place of men and women and the purpose of God. Especially remember that no woman is degraded by following the divine order of male and female. Read these pages with the Scriptures close at hand. There's a lot in that introduction. He says, I count it a privilege to give my hearty approval of the present volume entitled Feminism. Though it has been out of print for over 70 years. This book was out of print for over 70 years. Does that surprise you? The importance of the subject matter remains the same. The preachers who contributed to the contents of this book were true Baptist worthies who adhered firmly to the authority of the Holy Scriptures in all matter of faith and practice. We are living in an age in which the scriptural positions of men and women have been cast aside by a great majority of people. We're living in the same days, only worse. It is sad but true that a majority of churches and preachers have been guilty of abandoning rather than contending for the faith once delivered unto the saints, especially with regards to the woman's role in the home, the church, and society at large. The results have proved devastating to our homes, the churches, and country. A majority of children no longer have the privilege of being raised and influenced by a mother who is committed to being a keeper at home. Right? Titus chapter 2, verse number 5, right? That the word of God be not blasphemed. Right? Many young people are void of moral values. Now listen, such as honesty, kindness, and respect for authority. Women are now being ordained to the ministry and deaconship in some churches. Male kindness, courtesy, and chivalry with respect to women has been replaced by a general attitude that degrades the fairer sex. You know, men don't talk any different around women now than they used to. When you look at it, they talk the exact same. And the, the, men, and the women do too. Women will say the most crudest, wicked things. That's what feminism did though. The abominable lifestyles of homosexuality and lesbianism are on the rise. The divorce rate is astronomical. Women are looked upon by many men as mere sex objects and are degraded by hard and softcore pornography. It's true. And this was back in the 90s. Way worse. All of these maladies and many more are a direct result of the lack of Bible teaching regarding the proper roles and positions men and women are to occupy. See, that's one thing this feminist series does. It puts everything back in that perspective of the proper roles. What God intended. And there's two things that happens. Well, maybe three. You get mad. Right? Right? Then you get right, or you just stay mad, and you don't get right. But you'll still be wrong. May God be pleased to use this book to influence many parents that it is worth the material sacrifice to keep mother at home enjoying the role that God has appointed her. May it please the Lord to use this book to enlighten the eyes of multitudes who have been blinded by the lies of the women's liberation movement. May the churches where women speak out in the assembly be convicted of their flagrant disobedience to the scriptures. May God's true preachers be emboldened to preach the sacred truths of the scriptures regarding the woman's place in the home and the church after reading this volume. A multitude of blessing awaits the homes and churches that return to the time-honored principles of scripture that are set forth in this book. He says, I commend Elder Eckstein and the Berea Sovereign Grace Baptist Church of Bloomfield, New Mexico, for reprinting this much-needed book. 
So do I. My prayer is that it will have a wide circulation, a great influence over those who dare to read it and apply it to their lives. See, this stuff, I mean, pastors that tackle this issue don't make a lot of friends. That's why they don't tackle it. <laughs> they're more afraid of women than God, actually. <laughs> it's, they're more afraid of the women. <laughs> That's right. All right, so you ready? The menace of feminism? We're going to talk about that. And, now, and we're going to deal with actually kind of like identical rights versus equal rights, understanding the difference in those things, and, you know, just also the effects, the menace of feminism. We're not even going to get to really the results of it, but it's just interesting. J.W. Porter compiled this menace of feminism here, this section of there, and later on we'll get to the other parts, so I've got to get moving here. The writer fully realizes the delicate and difficult task on writing on this subject, but, uh, but fortunately, or unfortunately, as you like it, he is not among the number who are unwilling to pay the penalty for expressing their convictions. The man who speaks out in Meaton may get his cranium cracked or break up the meeting, but in either event, the game is worth the candle. In other words, the moment sometimes comes, and now is when silence becomes both cowardly and criminal. More and more thoughtful observers are coming to realize the menace of an unwomanly woman. Boy, that's the truth. But are, for one reason or another, deterred from expressing themselves on the subject. Whether appreciated or not, the real friend of woman is the man who will tell her the truth about herself. Do you see that? I'm going to say that again. Whether appreciated or not, the real friend of woman is the man who will tell her the truth about herself. With a matchless mother still graciously spared, though beyond fourscore years, and with sisters and daughters, the writer is prepared to affirm the wondrous worth and work of woman. He has never believed and hopes never to be driven to believe in the equality of the sexes. Let me ask you a question. Now, ladies, ask yourself, in the Bible, does it teach the equality of the sexes? No, it doesn't. It teaches there is a head and there is a body and there's one that follows. We're not equal with Christ either, right? Christ is the head. The sexes aren't equal, and I'm glad they're not because I really wouldn't want to look at myself. Like that. I wouldn't want to look over there and look at my wife and look at me. That wouldn't be very much fun. Right? We'll get to that. You'll understand that in a little while. The idea of woman being one equal to man is absolutely abhorrent to every right thinking, chivalrous, 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 thank you, gentleman who knows and loves womankind. Indeed, the man is to be pitied whose association with women has, conv has not convinced him of their superiority. She is of gentle, gentler mold, and withal, truer and nobler than man. That is so true. In the book of life, man is the prose and woman the poetry. They differ physically and physiologically. As has been said, next to God, we are indebted to woman, for, first for life itself and then for making it worth having. Amen. Women can have no greater or truer tribute that has been praised paid to her by Washington Irving when he said this, there is one in the world who feels for him who is sad, a keener pang than he feels for himself. There is one who rejoices in another's honor more than any which is one's own. There is one on whom another transcended excellence sheds no beam but that of delight. There is one who hides in others' infirmities more faithfully than one's own. There is one who loses all sense of self in the sentiment of kindness, tenderness, and devotion to another. That one is woman. Very true. Amen. The attempt to incite a spirit of rivalry or antagonism between the sexes is unnatural, cruel, and contemptible. In the very nature of the case, there can be no such thing as rivalry between man and woman. Neither constitute a sphere, but each a hemisphere. And together they make the sphere of life, love, and labor. Both have their work and must work together to accomplish a God-given destiny. Cooperation and not competition is the natural relationship of man and woman. You think you're not competing against each other, you're working together. 
It's not a competition between each other or vying for position. It's working together as one. One said it this way, as under the bow the string is, so unto man is woman. She bends him, yet she obeys. She draws, yet she follows. Useless each without the other. So what is the origin and growth of feminism in America? To the credit or discredit of our country, as one may view it, feminism did not originate in America. The first book that was published in defense of women's rights appeared in 1696 and was written by Mary Astle of England. Subsequent to this date, there were isolated instances of the advocacy of women's rights in England, France, and Italy. The movement as we know it probably grew out of the French Revolution. Yep. Yeah, the queen. Right, they dealt well, that said every man should rule his own house. Yep. Yep. That's right. The real beginning of the movement in America was in the second quarter of the 19th century. In the early 30s, Margaret Fuller published her book, Man vs. Woman. And this volume was followed shortly by Eliza Fernham, Fernham's Woman and Her Era. Both of these were more or less notable productions and exercised large influence in the formative period of the movement. The Anti-Slavery Society of Boston in 1832 had 12 women on its roll of members. In 1839, this society divided over the question of the membership of women. The first Women's Rights Convention in America was held at Seneca Falls in 1848. A platform was adopted demanding equal rights for all citizens. In connection with this convention, Elizabeth Cady Stanton wrote a letter to Susan B. Anthony from which is the following is taken. In times like these, every soul should work to do the work of a full-grown man. When I passed the gate of the Celestials and good St. Peter asked me where I wish to sit, I will say anywhere. So I am neither a Negro or a woman. Confer on me, great angel, the glory of whole manhood, so that henceforth I may feel unlimited freedom. That's feminism. Among the early and powerful advocates of the movement were Lloyd Garrison, Henry Ward Beecher, and Frederick Douglass. The acknowledged leader of the movement was Susan B. Anthony. What's that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Henry Ward Beecher was a preacher too, I believe. Susan B. Anthony, yes. It is worthy of note that the anti-slavery movement went hand-in-hand -hand with this movement, and the leadership of both was essentially the same. For quite a season, it seemed that they would win or lose together. In addition to the abolition of slavery and the giving to women all the rights of citizenship, Susan B. Anthony strenuously advocated the social equality of the white and black races. In fact, the women's rights, anti-slavery, and social equality movements were rocked in the same cradle and fostered by the same friends. So they tried to equate being a woman with a race. Just like they do with lesbianism today and homosexuality and transgender. They try to equal that to race. That's not the same thing. The special advocates of women's rights were shrewd enough to take advantage of the movement to confer citizenship upon Negroes to extend to all residents of our country. While the while, war, while the thought of war brought victory to one movement earlier than to the other, in their genesis and development, they were closely related. If the Negro was to be given the franchise, the average citizen could not see any good reason for withholding it from women. In 1866, the American Equal Rights Society was formed by a combination of the Women's Rights Societies and part of the Anti-Slavery Society. The preamble to the Constitution that was adopted reads as follows. Whereas by the war... Society is one more dissolved in its original elements, and in reconstruction of our government, we stand face to face with the broad question of our natural rights. All associations based on special claims for special classes are too narrow and partial for the hour. Therefore, from the baptism of this second revolution, they always got a bunch of religious devils, purified and exalted through suffering. Seeing with a holier vision that the peace, prosperity, and perpetuity of this republic rests on equal rights to all, 
We today assembled in our 11th National Women's Rights Con- Convention, bury the woman in the citizen and our organization in that of the American Equal Rights Association. The work of the association, as stated, was to secure equal rights to all American citizens, particularly the right of the franchise, irrespective of race, color, or sex. It will be noted, too, that they desired to bury the woman in the citizen, in spite of the fact that God created them male and female, man and woman. In 1868, the 14th Amendment was adopted, and later the 15th Amendment. In 1869, the National National Suffrage Association was formed with the avowed purpose of securing the ballot on equal terms with men. Boy, was that a mistake. The equal rights platform, you say, Pastor, do you believe women should vote? No. No. Absolutely, 100%, no. Should they run for office? No. Absolutely, 100%, no. Do I care if that makes anybody mad? Absolutely, 100%, no. It actually gets me happy. It makes me happy that that makes you mad. If it makes anybody mad, it makes me happy. Why? Because I know what God's order is. And I know why women shouldn't vote. Bill Clinton is a good reason why women shouldn't vote. Mm -hmm. Among other things. I love this series. I forgot how much I love this. Zach, do you like this? I do, actually. It's good. It's good. In 1869, the... <laughs> Sorry. The Equal Rights Platform was found too broad and was abandoned in 1870. Numerous petitions to Congress were presented from time to time, and the agitation continued until equal suffrage became a law of the land. It should not be forgotten that women's suffrage has been secured in spite of a strong anti-suffrage league composed entirely of women. The success of the movement was undoubtedly due to its leadership rather than to the wishes of the rank and file of the women in the United States. Where the question of women's suffrage submitted to the men, to the, or excuse me, to the women of the several states, it is probable that a majority of the women of these states would be found against it. It seems to be a case, in, this is back in eight, the 1870s, just so you know. It seems to be a case, or the ni- early 1900s, it seems to be the case in which men gave some women leaders what a majority of the women never asked for, and probably did not desire. Considerable space has been given the, here to the franchise as it appeared to be the coveted goal of feminism. It may be well to remind the feminists that though they have the ballot, the matriarchate is yet only a myth, a dream that will never come true. Many believe, and with such show of reason, that the political sphere as naturally belongs to a man as the home sphere belongs to to woman. One man said women's suffrage, if realized, would be the death blow to domestic life and happiness. It was. It destroyed the family. Will the, will the women disprove this by the way they use the ballot? Will they vote as women or as citizens? We shall see what we shall see, and let us hope we shall see what many of us do not expect to see, only good. Well, I can tell you, it was bad. The following thoughtful and prophetic editorial appeared in the Courier Journal, November 3, 1917. Has woman suffrage purified politics in Colorado and California? Is it likely to purify politics in the cotton fields of the South where the Negroes congregate in the crowded centers of the population of the North and East where the purchasable male voters will be reinforced by the purchasable female, purchasable female voters? Politics everywhere, a rather unsavory business. What assurance can you give that you will make it less so? Did you check out the last election between Hillary and Donald Trump? Did that look like women made that any more savorable, like any more, any better? Oh, my goodness, it was awful. And I'm still glad that I don't have to hear her voice for four years. It is so much better fun, so much more fun to make fun of Donald Trump than it is to listen to that voice. 
And I'd so much rather have a man in there anyway. It is likely to... <laughs> Politics everywhere is a rather unsavory business. If each and every woman voter were such as you, obviously ladies of intellect, education, and public spirit, the ship of the state might with safety be committed to your hands. But you fail to take into account that the ballot, even as the dew of heaven, falls alike upon the just and the unjust. In heated contests and close elections, women of refinement are likely to stay away from the polls. But the ignorant and unrefined, the forward and corrupt, corrupt will be there, else the practical machine politicians will know the reason why. But my dear countrywoman, the ballot about which you set such store is the merest trifle by comparison with the change in human conditions and relations forecast by a movement laid primarily to the unrest of woman and in its activities promoting and perpetuating that unrest. For I need to tell you, I need not tell you that the achievement of the ballot will not end the agitation. What he's saying is your risk of what you want, all these equal rights, you are going to fundamentally change the family in America forever. And they did. Behind your comparatively unimportant demands for the ballot stalks feminism, which proposes the abolition of sex. They don't want male and female. It's the unisex, Baphomet. We're here. They would never be happy with just that. It would never make them happy. They must, fun they must completely rebel against God's order, 100% completely. The elimination of the domestic fabric and the substitution of the religion of reason for the gospel of Christ and the apostles. Something of this sort prevailed in France during the reign of terror. Under it, the women of the period went wilder than the men. The world of today... Torn to its foundations by war and goaded by the cant about progress is ripe for all kinds of experimentation. The world which knew not the miracles of modern invention was a slow couch by comparison with our world. But can we say that the world has grown in grace? Is it better educated but it is more capable, more spiritual? Is it happier, wiser? Was there nothing for women in old-fashioned love and marriage? Think about this, please. Was there nothing for her and her children in the shelter, I, in the queenship of the home? And if she surrenders these to get down into the bullring of politics and scramble with men in the dirt, to enter the open labor market and all along the line compete with the men for works and wages, her sex prerogatives gone, shall more moral nature, shall her moral nature escape contamination? Nope. How contaminated is woman from being thrown into that workforce and being thrown into that area? How much has it contaminated her? Now as ever, dear friends, the world is a world of sin, disease, and death. The woman has been its saving grace. The home has been its earthly blessing. Equal the shrine and refuge of man. The source and resource of the young and the old. Yet you say that it must go. That it is obsolete. That the new woman will know it not. That she has the same right to vote the, as the man has. To fill places of distinqu distinction that the man has. To wear boots and to be bad just like the men. Granted... But when she has divided these things with man, if in the physical combat she goes not down, what does she get and what does the world get? All of us admit that the world is bad enough, but shall we mend it by making the woman as tough as the men? The domestic fabric gone? Gone the religion of Christ? Shall there be no sanctuary anywhere? I plead with you, my countrywoman, in the name of manhood, in the name of womanhood, in the name of God, to draw back from the awful abyss of revolution into which you would cast the experience of the ages, the wisdom of the prophets and the law, the truths of the gospel of Christ and the apostles, to try an experiment of reversing nature, which has been tried many times to the desecration of women and the ruin of man. In light of the subsequent events, the above makes exceedingly interesting reading. Mr. Gladstone, one of the greatest statesmen of all the ages, was strongly opposed to the suffrage movement. Anybody know who Mr. Gladstone is? You remember? Brother Finney, have you studied him at all in any of your writings in history? I think, I believe he was a judge, possibly. But one of the greatest statesmen of, yes, yes. 
was strongly opposed to su- in speaking against an amendment favoring women's suffrage. He said this, I offer it the strongest opposition in my power, and I must disclaim and renounce responsibility for the measure. Because he knew what was going to happen. He knew where it was going to send families and where it was going to go. Mary Wollstonecraft, who is who it is claimed started the demand in England for the electorate for women, was referred to by Horace Walpole as a hyena in petticoats. Wow. Never seen a hyena in petticoats. Aaron, have you ever seen a hyena in petticoats? I don't know. The caricature, the caricature is severe, yet it will probably be granted that she was not in all things like a certain Mary who had chosen the good part. The truth is, and it may as well be told, that neither of the great political parties of America favored women's suffrage, but neither were willing for the other to reap the benefit of leading in the movement. Even our great president, Woodrow Wilson, was vigorously opposed to the movement, but it was overcome by pressure and prospect. His change of front on this question constitutes the weakest point in his career. The triumph of the movement was the victory of party politics. The anti-suffragists of New York in opposing the movement said, it threatens the home, threatens the sacredness of American ties, threatens the church, and undermines the constitution of our great republic. The militant suffragist, with her window-smashing campaign and hunger strikes, neither commends herself nor her cause to right-thinking men and women. At a meeting, the Women's Council of Washington, D.C., March 1888, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, as reported by the Chicago Tribune, said this, I have often said to you, we of the present day and the next generation of women will not stand arguing with you as we have for half a century. The organizations of labor all over the country are holding out their hands to women. The time is not far distant when if men do not do justice to women, the women will shake hands with labor, with socialists, with anarchists. And you will have the scenes of the Revolution of France acted over and over again in this republic. They threatened them. Sure it is. The women's suffrage movement has looked in a positive light. So now we come to the thought of equal rights. The ceaseless cry of the feminists has been for equal rights. And this is a catchphrase and one with which the which to conjure the phrase as it relates to the feminist movement is to say the least misleading. Its fallacy may be seen in the fact that equal rights are not equivalent to identical rights. The respective duties of men and women may be equal, but this does not imply that they are identical. The feminist conception of equal rights constitutes the menace of the movement. The average feminist seems to fail to grasp the fact that things may be of equal value, yet be different in kind and character. She is clearly entitled to equal opportunities, rights, and rewards. That she has not always been accorded this equality is lamentably true. The fact, however, that she has not received justice in the past is no reason she should transgress the laws of nature and of God to obtain her rights for the present. Organic differences imply and necessitate functional differences. Neither natural nor divine laws can be broken without paying the penalty. Some of the differences between the male and the female would seem conclusive as to difference of sphere and function. Here's where we're going to get into this. Listen, this... This is, a, this is a good quote. A woman is not, there's biological differences. A woman is not, as many seem to believe, a female man. If you want to get yourself in trouble as a husband, look at your wife as a female man and expect out of her the same. And you're going to find real quick that things aren't going to work out well because you're expecting her to act like a female man. She's not going to do that. And you wouldn't want her to do that anyway. 
While made of man, she is separate and distinct creation with marked differences of body, mind, and spirit. The primal and most distinctive difference between man and woman is found in the fact of sex. This is true of the generative functions to which the entire body is designedly and nearly related. In this regard, Walter Heapy says this. The digestive system is necessary to the life of the individual, the reproductive for the life of the species, and all other systems of organs. Excretory, vascular, nervous, muscular, skeletal, and sensory are called forth and built up in accordance with the needs which arise for the more efficient discharge of these two, primary, two primitive systems. But, and if this is of great moment, on of, on of these two primitive systems, the reproductive is not only structurally, functionally, fundamentally different in the male and the female, and since all other organs and systems are affected by this, it is certain that the male and the female are essentially different throughout. You say, duh. But honestly, they don't get that. How could two things be equal when they're not the same? Right. Sexual and other differences in here in the very nature of man and woman, male and female, created he them. Virchow, the eminent biologist and scientist, says this. Woman is woman. Only through her genital gland, all the peculiarities of her body and mind, of her in intuition and nervous activity, delicacy of the roundness of the limbs, with the peculiar enlargement of the pelvis, the development of the breast when her voice has attained its fullness, the beautiful head of hair, the depth of feeling, truth of intuition, gentleness, devotion, and faithfulness. In short, everything which we admire and honor in woman as truly womanly is merely the dependence of the ovary. <laughs> says it functions her body functions differently she functions differently one of the most professor thomas says this one of the most important facts which stands out in comparison of the physical traits of men and women is that the man is a more specialized instrument for motion quicker on his feet with a longer reach and fitted for bursts of energy while woman has a greater fund of stored energy and is consequently more fitted for endurance. It's the design. They're not equal. They're not the same. Right? Another physical difference in the relatively short infancy of the girl, the girl develops more rapidly than the boy and hence a much shorter period of infancy. This gives a briefer period for training and development. The head of the male child is somewhat smaller than that of the female. In the woman, the heart is smaller and the lungs develop more rapidly than in man. There are not as many red corpuscles in the blood of women as in the blood of man, and her pulse beats slower. It has been well said that the condition of the blood has much to do with the creative power, memory, and generally the whole mental and physical life. Barnes says that the teaching of today that, that action is for women as for men, though ideal, is a cruel and false doctrine. It is woman as she is that counts, not primarily what she does. little biology lesson, huh? But it makes sense, doesn't it? They are different. Now, this should speak to those evolutionists and everything else that, that if fine, you don't want to accept the Bible, but accept the plain facts of your science because it's right there mental differences okay the question here is not the superiority or inferior inferiority of woman's mind to that of man but rather one of dissimilarity they don't think the same right boy do you learn that the hard way over and over and over again. Oh, you just wait. You keep laughing back there. You just keep laughing back there. Uh-huh. No, it is learning because some lessons are harder to learn and they take over and over and over again. I won't have to say any more. Time will prove it all. Even the brain of woman has its feminine characteristics. It is fortunate for humanity that this is true. Amen. While the average weight of the brain of man is 1,350 grains and that of woman only 1,200 grains, it is also true that the woman's brain, in proportion to the weight of her body, is practically the same as that of a man. 
The fact that most of the world's greatest intellectual achievements are to be credited to man does not necessarily argue women's intellectual inferiority. It is only of comparative recent date that women have seriously addressed herself to the question of education. Only within the last few decades, he says, at this time, have the doors of many of our greatest universities been opened to her. It is probably true that the masculine mind is more massive and method. Meth- methodological, while the, that of the woman acts more quickly and characterized by greater intuitive power. Woman's thinking is doubtless more influenced by her feelings than that of man. That's true. She thinks and reacts more with feelings. She seems to possess as at least equal imagination and perhaps superior memory, though her process of reasoning does not appear so logical as that of man. She does not possess the judicial cast of mind, though she may often reach a sound conclusion quicker than man. What that means is that women don't compartmentalize very well. They're not made that way. Whereas men can look at something and they can see some good in that. Where if you scorn a woman, you're dead. And there's like there's like really no negotiating that. It's just like, what's that? They don't negotiate with terrorists. That's right. There's like no negotiating there. Right? He said, yep, he knows. He's down with the struggle right there. Anyway, but she just thinks differently. She does not possess the judicial cast of mind, though she may often... See, and, and we know that from Eve. Now go back and look at Eve. What happened to her? She was deceived. Why? She could not judge well. And Satan appealed to her what? Feelings. He appealed to her feelings. It's not that she's dumb or anything like that. She's very intelligent. He just appealed to her feelings. He got her to think with her feelings. Apparently, her type of mind is perfectly fitted for her God-ordained sphere and duties. That's true. Take her out of her God-ordained sphere of duties and put her in politics, and you have modern-day America. Where men can't stand up and be like, look, okay, I'm going to stop for a second, and I'm going to say this to you. Today, men can't be men in politics. Men can't even be men as pastors anymore and stand up and say straight things because they have to worry about the feminist viewpoint. And not, no, nobody's going to walk around saying, I'm a feminist. They're not going to do that, okay? The point is that people are such babies. The only reason why Donald Trump got voted into office, there is one reason, because people were sick of that limp-wristed black dude that act like a female chick all the time and ran around and talked like a little woman, and they got tired of it. So they brought out a white dude that act like a tough guy that act like he was from the wwe and everybody's like yeah finally a dude that just says something he's got a pulse and he acts like a man and he comes out and he yells at people yeah bring it on i want that guy that's the guy i want i want a guy that has a pulse that you can feel that he's not scared of hillary clinton he was the perfect wrestler to put against hey i would have jumped off the top rope and dropped an elbow on her too I so would have. I would have done the laid drop from the from the top rope. I would have jumped off the cage too. I probably wouldn't have hit her in the back of the head with a Halliburton. I wouldn't have done that, but I don't know if she was coming after me or not, I guess. No. Anyway, the point do you see the point? I'm sorry, I, I woke Andy up. Sorry, Andy, I didn't mean to wake you up. I think I woke Andy up. I had my WWE moving, I'm calm now. It's over. No, but seriously, that that was a rant. That was. The feminist rant. I even woke Lee up. Lee's wait, paying attention now. He's like, man, I'm up now. You done woke me up out of my nap here. Listen, that's the truth, and that's why he's in there, because somebody just wanted a man to say something. They, they didn't even care if they agreed with it. They just wanted him to be a man, and they just wanted him to say something. And they got him. All right. Here we go. Apparently, okay, so that her mind is influenced by her nature, there can be little doubt. Okay, so. 
I'm probably not going to talk about that. It is for this and other reasons that many have been led to doubt the wisdom of coeducation. At such a time, neither mind nor body should be subjected to exacting labor. In Europe, the contracts for singers often contain provision for rest during the monthly period. Women's mental mechanism is influenced during the period of gestation. The thought and fact of motherhood greatly influences the mental faculties. It is both natural and right that this should be true. And certainly this fact is a blessing to mankind. It seems pretty well established that there is such a thing as a male and a female mind. Now we're going to talk about the moral differences. It is within the moral realm that women may well and truly boast of her superiority over man. That's true. In practically all the cardinal virtues, it is safe to say that women excel. Turn to Romans chapter 1 quickly. I want to show you this. Romans 1. It says in verse number 26, For this cause God gave them up unto vile affections. For even their women did change the natural use of that which is against nature. You know why? Because women are normally more moral than men. So that's why he said even the women. It was that bad. That even the women did leave the natural use. They're usually the ones that are like, no, I'm not doing that. In practically all the cardinal virtues, it is safe to say that women excels. Whatever she may lack in deeds of physical daring or intellectual achievement, it is to her continual credit in the world's everlasting gain that she is superior in that which counts most of the time in eternity. As a rule, they are more religious and take their religion more seriously than men. That's very true. A lot of times when you start churches, there are more women there than there are men. We've seen, we saw that here for a long time. There were more women here than there were men. Mm-hmm. Yep. Why is that? Because they're more spiritual most of the time. A lot of times. Their faith in God is stronger and apparently more easily maintained. In all the realm of life and living, there is nothing more beautiful than the simple, unfaltering faith of a consecrated Christian woman. That is true. Sacrifice, which is the key word of Christianity, is her joy and crown. It is probably safe to say that her religious superiority is largely due to the nature and character of her duties and is compensation for her divinely imposed limitations. So he's saying God gives her an extra measure of grace to deal with things and to endure things because of the position he put her in. Right? Surely she should esteem the reward sufficient. Many men would like to be as gentle and beautiful as woman, but this is denied them by the very laws of their being. The father would love to feel that the child cherishes him for him the same affection that it does for the mother. Yet in his heart he knows this can never be. It is but right that the one who bears the child should command the child's deepest devotion. God has dig- dignified her with the motherhood of mankind, and whatever man may have accomplished, it has been under God by the loving heart and tender hand of the woman. Let me ask you a question now. What does the Bible say? A child left to himself bringeth... Why, why not the father? Because the woman is with her, with the child all the time, or supposed to be. But when she's not, it brings shame. See that? Very clear. It is but right that the one who bears the child should command the deepest devotion. God has dignified her with the motherhood of mankind, and whatever man may have accomplished, it has been under God by the loving heart and tender hand of woman. Every, evermore it is true that the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that moves the world. Remember that. I want you to remember that. If you're writing something down, write this down. Evermore it is true that the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that moves the world. Spurgeon said the same thing, almost a similar thing. The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that moves the world. Now, why do you think Satan wants your wife out of your house not raising your children? Why? Because he knows Why do you think he wants you as a wife out of order, out of the home? Why do you think he wants that? He wants that so he can disrupt the home and destroy it. Because he knows how it works. 
He knows what she's equipped for. But if I can get her, this is the deception of Satan. If I can get the woman to think that the grass is greener on the other side and the husband to think the grass is greener on the other side, pull her out of where she is her most powerful and most useful and cause discontent in her heart. Are you listening to me? Cause discontent in her heart. So she'll go somewhere else. I will render her ineffective for God by putting her someplace she cannot be effective. See how that works? Oh, he never did that. He didn't? He did it to Eve. Genesis chapter 3. Yea, hath God said. Come on, Eve. God doth know that in the day ye thereof ye shall be as gods. You're not going to have to. You're going to be equal with Adam. You're going to be a god. Come on, Eve. You want to be equal, don't you? You want equality, don't you, Eve? So you know what? So you know what those moms do? They sell out for 10 shekels in a shirt. You know what dad does? He does the same. He sells his wife out for 10 shekels in a shirt. Same, same principle. Right? Same principle, there's no different. Evermore it is true that the hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that moves the world, and this should be glory enough. When father's sword shall have been eaten away by the rust of the years, mother's Bible will still cheer, comfort, and bless. And we're almost done here. The basis of feminism, this is all under the same, I believe it, yeah. yeah this is all the same. Yeah, almost done here. Okay, the rise of feminism is not an accident or coincidence, but the natural result of a rebellion against the limitations and duties of sex. The leaders of this movement seem to believe that God has dealt unfairly with them in creating them female. To become the father of a family or grow into the neuter gender appears to be the ultimate ambition of some of the unsexed socialism, socialisms of our century. The de-womanized woman hates motherhood in the same ratio that it is loved by the womanly woman. They despise motherhood. They despise it. That's right, despise. Speaking in this regard, Miss Thomas, for several years, president of Bern Mauer, said this, they have spent half a lifetime fitting themselves for a scholar's work, and then may be asked to choose between that and marriage. No one can estimate the number of women who remain unmarried in revolt before such a horrible alternative. See how much they hate God's order? One who can give utterance to such words is about as well fitted to educate young women as a saloon keeper is to administer the Lord's Supper. True. It is a sad and sickening fact that a majority of the female graduates of many of our universities never marry. In the light of the view they are taught to hold concerning the sanctity of marriage, their single blessedness may probably prove a real blessing to the men they might have married. That's true. One lady said this, Even the assumption that the highest destiny of woman lies in motherhood is refuted by the history of civilization. The synthetic representatives of higher humanity in a monistic sense will be those who whose physio, psychophysical, that's a weird word, constitution enables them to overstep the bounds of sexuality and to raise and increase the inward relation between the sexes. Those beings who are sub subject to the conditions both of the male and the female, for lofty souls there is nothing more unbearable than the idea of a bondage to sex. To be excluded on account of sex from any possibility of development, from any road to knowledge within the realm of human existence, can but awaken in such souls a, souls a hatred against sex. Well, she, she's despising the fact that God made her a female. She hates the fact that God made her a female. So she's rebelling against the fact that God made her male and made them male and female. They hate it.
Mark chapter 10, verse number 6. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. For this cause, God shall... For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. What, the, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. This is God's original intent. This is the way God designed everything. According to this, the hermaphrodite would be the ideal creature. It is both unjust and unfortunate that these advocates of sex extinction should blame man that they were females. They may as well learn once for all that their sex cannot be changed by legislation or rebellion. They've got that today, though, don't they? Today they have that to where they're doing the same thing. They're there, by legislation, they want to say they can make themselves different. They can change themselves. If we could with propriety petition to the Almighty to change the condition of the sexes and let man take a turn at bearing of children and in suffering ailments peculiar to women, which render them unfit for certain positions in business, why in this case, if we really wished to be men and thought God would change the established order, we might make our petition. But why ask Congress to make us men? Ellen Key said this, The feminism which has driven individualism to the point where the individual asserts her personality in opposition to, instead of with the race, the individualism which becomes self-concentration, anti-social egoism, although watchword upon its banners is society instead of the family. Where's that come from? Society instead of the family. Communism, Marxism, that's right. That's what that is. This feminism will bear the blame should hatred lead to war. The advanced woman resents the fact that she is a woman. She rebels against the difference in sex and if possible would obliterate the fact that one is male and the other female. She is unsexed and would if possible break down all the barriers and distinctions of sex. She seems unmindful of the fact that we must reckon with the eternal he and she. In her grammar there is but one gender and that is the neuter. There is no he or she, but simply and solely it. What do we have now? This was written 150 years ago. What do we have now, or 100 years ago or more? What do we have now? We have the same thing. We don't have, they, they, you're not allowed, cops are told you're not allowed to say he or she. On campuses, you're not allowed to say he or she. You're to ask them what they want to be identified as, what they want to be called. Right? Seemingly, she will never be satisfied until she can become the head of the family. Provided, of course, that there must be families, her ambition appears to be to, be to make herself independent of God and man. To be keeper at home is abhorrent and by her esteemed a relic of barbarianism. She revels in the limelight and longs for a career. She has issued her own proclamation of emancipation and will not slave her life out for any man. She prefers the club and the hotel to the church and the home and is only at home when she is away from home. Yeah, no, not that club, the actual club. Home sweet home long ago lost all its sweetness for her. And just here comes the tragedy of our civilization the disintegration of the American home. The citadel of our civilization has been the solidarity and integrity of our homes. Our nation is impregnable and our flag imperishable so long as the American home remains intact. Look at it now. And the American home will remain intact no longer than the American mother remains what she has been and what the God of heaven and earth intended her to be. To bear children is a handicap and a burden against which her whole being rebels. If she happens to have a child, more likely than children, if it be a fault, certainly it is not her fault. The child, if there be one, is committed to a nurse to whom she would not trust her money. A providence, perhaps, in disguise. Caring nothing for Christ or little children, she sallies forth to subdue the earth, but not to multiply and replenish it. In the absence of children, and they are usually absent, she frequently adopts a pug dog upon which she lavishes the wealth of her motherly affection. 
The lucky pup, to all intents and purposes, becomes one of the family with all the rights and privileges thereunto belonging. I've seen this before, by the way. He becomes the heir apparent to all the fame and fortune of this foster mother. Indeed, he is a lucky dog in the envy and despair of his less favored canine friends. Desire of economic defendants. Sorry. A few more pages. We're done here. Such a desire with proper limitations is praiseworthy, but in most instances with women, it is built upon a misconception of values. In not a few cases, the father, husband, or brother may be responsible for this desire. The husband who intentionally or otherwise creates the impression on his wife's mind that she is a parasite is to blame for her wrong thinking on the subject. It is the scriptural and responsible duty of the man to provide for his household. This duty inheres in the very nature of the marriage relation and is clearly commanded by him whose word is final on all subjects. The Bible says the man is to be the breadwinner. He's the one that's to bring in the money. He's the one to take care of things. Not only is it his duty to provide for his family, but Holy Writ declares him worse than an infidel if he refuses to make this provision. Is it reasonable to suppose that the woman can keep the home, care for the children, and in addition equally share man's toils? The wife who properly cares for the home and children has not only done her full share, but has accomplished a task that is more delicate and difficult than is required of man. She is just as really a producer as is the man, and is or should be deemed an equal partner. It is not a question of the identity of service, but of the value of the service rendered. Shame on the man who causes the wife or daughter to feel that they do not contribute their full quota to the support and welfare of the home. Their presence in prayers, their example and companionship is an inspiration and a blessing that cannot be computed in dollars and cents. We should not desire to escape the fact that we are, one and all, dependent and interdependent creatures. No one liveth to himself or by himself, and absolute independence is impossible in this life. We are wholly dependent upon God and partially dependent upon one another. There are many instances in which the wife and daughter are forced to toil away from home to earn a support for themselves and their loved ones. This they have done and are doing, and that too without perhaps any thought of economic independence or equal rights. There are women who detest the drudgery of housework and imagine that some other character of work would better suit their taste and talent. It is a sad day when the wife considers herself in bondage and deems her daily duties but drudgery. The love of God and of home will lend romance to the commonplace of life and glorify its toils and tears. When she had done what she could, she had done all that man can ask or God requires. It has been well said of women, men living without you by themselves become savage and sinful. The purer you are, the more they are restrained and the more they are elevated. It is your work to form the young mind, to give it direction and instruction, to develop its love for the good and true. It is your work to make home happy, to nourish all the virtues, and to instill all the sentiments which build men into good citizens. The foundation of our national character is laid by the mothers of the nation. I say that heaven, seeing the importance of the world of piety in you, has so modified your relations to man that it shall be comparatively easy for you to descend into the valley over which all must walk before their feet can stand upon the heights of Christian experience, between which and heaven's doors the ascent is easy. Surely woman, women can have contributed their full quota to the sum total of human wealth, happiness, and consecration. If the good mother only contributed her infinite influence, it would be a larger contribution than any man could possibly make to the world's welfare. Our nation owes a debt to its mothers that only eternity can pay. It would probably be impossible to find one truly great and godly man who did not have a good mother. George Washington, the father of our country, owed his character under God to his good mother. A French general, after talking to the mother of George Washington, said this, it is not surprising that America can produce such great men, since she can boast of such mothers. James A. Garfield, after taking the oath as president, turning to his mother, said, It's all because of you, mother. William McKinley, after taking the oath of office, turned and kissed his mother. Our nation depends upon our homes, and our homes upon the influence of the mothers. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old he will not depart from it. Gray-headed he will return to his mother's God. Professor Drummond, in his lecture on motherhood, said this, All the machinery, the preceding work of nature, is to the end that she may produce a mother. The work itself is one of the stupendous processes of nature. The mother is the ultimate object of the kingdom. 
The noble influence of mother, though perhaps not manifest at the time, is beautifully described in the following lines from Longfellow. I shot an arrow into the air. It fell on the earth. I know not where. I breathed a song into the air. It fell on the earth. I know not where. Long, long afterwards, in an oak, I found the arrow still unbroke. And the song from the beginning to end, I found again in the heart of a friend. That's the the influence and the importance of motherhood. So you see, you know, and mom being home. In this first part, what we, what we see is the difference, really we see the difference in man and woman as far as the way God intended them to be, and that they're not equal. They're never supposed to be equal. They're not identical in that sense. Of what, what people call identical today, or equal today, they mean identical. God made them male and female. And this was the attack that the feminist movement, that's the attack. It was on the family. It was to destroy the family. Next, we're going to talk about the statistics of what happened to the homes after the results of feminism and what it did in America and how it fundamentally changed this country. It transformed this country. It changed it completely. When you take mom out of the home and children aren't being raised by mom and they're not being raised by a father and there's no family structure there, you change the entire nation. When it was built upon biblical principles and homes that stayed together and people that had to survive together, work the land together, they were together, they loved one another, they worked together hard and that, you found families that were stronger, the structural family. Now it's like all for one, one for all. Everybody is scattered abroad. Nobody cares where their family is. Nobody, nobody has anything to do with them any longer. Why? Because, you know, and, then that, and that's why you also see today that you have reasonably healthy people being put into nursing homes and assisted care living. I'm not talking about people that can't be. I'm talking, you know why? Because, well, they were thrown in daycare when they were a kid. So they throw their parents in daycare when they get older. That's what they did. But the Bible says to honor thy father and thy mother that thy days may be long upon the earth. But see the difference? See what happens? That's what, that's what happens when you destroy the foundation. The Bible says if the, if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And that's the attack, is to destroy the foundations. So they destroy the foundation of the home, they take mom out of the home, they make her discontent, you change the nation. The communists knew that. The Marxists knew that. That's why they brought it over here. The French Revolution, all those things happened and were pictures of that. See, they wanted to do the French Revolution here. They have, but it's over time. It wasn't able to be instant like they wanted to do in France because God had other plans for America. Anyway, so that's the first part of this. Identical does not, equal does not mean identical. Things that are different are not the same, right? Father, Lord, we thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the truth of these things. Thank you for the home, Lord. Thank you for the structure that you set about. Help us to obey that, Lord. Help us understand those keepers at home, why that's important, why you instituted that, and why you want us to follow it. Help us to do that so we can be families that honor and glorify you and our nation will as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I am happy since my burdens roll away.